Good evening and welcome to the second event in our continuing series, Resilience in Times of Crisis. My name is Rabbi Max Feldhacke and I am the project leader for the Jewish Future Forum. In our first event in the series with Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, we delved into the topic of resilience vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic and interfaith discourse. We learned much about not only the situation in the New York metro area, but about the potential future of interfaith discourse at large. Now, as some parts of the world, particularly Europe and the United States, are beginning to see some light at the end of the tunnel, in no small part due to the highly effective vaccination programs, and we begin honestly contemplating about a quasi post-corona world, the topic of resilience remains relevant. Personal and communal resilience is not simply of importance during the immediate crisis of a global pandemic, indeed during any immediate crisis, resilience transcends the immediate crisis to the post-crisis period. How do we continue? Which course is best? Which narratives, both personal and communal, will we develop now that the crisis is slowly and hopefully inexorably beginning to pass? Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Dr. Hazia Diner, with whom we will look at the topic of resilience in the light of the aftermath of the Holocaust. Specifically, Professor Diner will examine and elaborate on the American Jewish community's response to the devastation and destruction of Jewish life in Europe. According to Professor Diner, the efforts of the American Jewish community to come to terms with the Holocaust were scattered, experimental, grassroots, and at times contradictory, and reflected the desire to pick up the pieces of Jewish life and demonstrated a resilience and improvisation, which revealed the degree to which American Jews saw themselves as the heirs to that which had been destroyed. This discourse and examination of American Jewish resilience is of great importance for us Jews in Germany and Europe. Understanding and perhaps even learning from an American Jewish example of developing and practicing resilience is important, not least of all because of the growing bonds between American and European Jews and Jewish institutions. The resilience of one part of the Jewish people is the resilience of the entire Jewish people. Professor Dr. Hazia Diner is the Paul and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at NYU, New York University, a specialist in the United States history. As a specialist in the United States history, she has written and taught in the fields of immigration history, American women history, and American Jewish history. So it is with great, great pleasure that I give the floor to you, Professor, and uh, we are very excited to hear what you have to say. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. And to say the least, I wish we were all together and I could see your faces and we could have um, a coffee together and make this a much more uh, uh, personal kind of uh, um, session, but obviously we can't. So there's no need to belabor the point. Um, I now realize that um, Rabbi Sarna spoke about the present and the future. And um, uh, Rabbi and, and, and Maximilian also uh, made allusions to where we go from here. I'm a historian, and so I'm going to talk about the past. And uh, perhaps in the discussion, we can uh, think about how do we use the example examples from the past to understand where we are now in the present, and perhaps to even uh, plot how we might go into the future. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about history. So this is the basic premise of my uh, uh, talk and of uh, the research I've done, which is um, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, uh, indeed even during um, the war, as it was becoming uh, uh, painfully clear uh, what the fate of European Jewry was going to be, um, Jews in the United States uh, individually, through communal institutions, uh, began to ask, what does this mean for us? And um, how do we transform this uh, into something that is uh, uh, productive of what our uh, future should be? Uh, so um, just as a uh, kind of ground, uh, sort of a look at the ground of American Jewish life, um, again, we can't talk about a, an American Jewish community because there were dozens and dozens of organizations and institutions, um, publications, uh, people working solo, people working 
um, through these institutions. And all of them converged around the idea that American Jewry needed to be involved in the rebuilding of Jewish life and that they needed to demonstrate resilience in the face of this devastating tragedy. They never agreed among themselves what they should do. They argued among themselves what they should do. Um, they competed with each other. Uh, they squabbled with each other about it, but they all understood that it was their obligation in the light of what was going on and what had happened to the Jews of Europe that they had to demonstrate a degree of um, flexibility, pliability, elasticity, toughness um, to uh, go about the process of rebuilding. So um, I remember the Holocaust um, and the devastations of the war were something that happened quite far away from them, uh, the Jews of the United States as individuals were uh, untouched by uh, uh, the horrors. Um, you could say it was true of the Jews of Britain also, but remember these are people who were being bombed uh, uh, um, daily. So their lives were really disrupted by the war. American Jews lived behind uh, uh, the kind of protect, protection of, of the ocean and living uh, uh, distant from the uh, places of carnage but yet they felt a communal responsibility. They felt a uh, bond with the, with the Jewish people who were um, on uh, uh, the sort of front lines of assault. And not many American Jews had relatives. Okay, um, the uh, one sort of little statistic in this is that it was only in 1930 that a majority of the Jews of the United States were American born. But it means that even then, after that, 50% had families still in Europe, and uh, many of the American Jews were themselves, uh, had, had immigrated, and um, those places that were being uh, uh, um, overrun uh, by uh, the German armies and which were uh, be in which the Jews were being eliminated were the places they came from. These were their towns uh, where they had family who had not immigrated. Uh, so it was personal, despite the fact that uh, Jew, American Jews were not there. And it was personal because, again, they felt they uh, had, uh, uh, that it was their responsibility. They felt a tremendous uh, uh, empathy uh, and, and, and pain, pained empathy with the Jews of Europe. So in this period, again, during and then after the war, um, they, uh, in a variety of ways, went about this process of trying to reshape Jewish life, reshape their own communities, and to put in place a series of um, practices or a series of um, new uh, institutions, create new texts that would allow them to rebuild themselves and rebuild the Jews of Europe. Now, much of what went through their discourse, the way they talked about it was essentially Jewish life in Europe has been destroyed. Those places were the wellsprings of Jewish uh, cultural production. They were the sources of ideas, texts, uh, um, culture, and they're not, they're not there any longer. And we now have to pick up where they left off, where they so brutally um, had been forced to leave off. We have to become the creators. So I'm gonna give one example, and I know some of you are cantorial students, and you may know that throughout uh, the period through the 1920s, um, even a little bit before that, the reform movement in the United States had wanted to create a cantorial school, and they essentially never had the funds to do it. They're always cash strapped and they couldn't do it. But in 1948, okay, three years after the uh, um, end of the war, um, the uh, Hebrew Union College opened the School for Sacred Music. And at the gr a great ceremony that took place um, at Carnegie Hall, the New York, New York Philharmonic uh, played, uh, Nelson Glick, the president of the Hebrew Union College, literally said what I just said, which is we have to pick up uh, the strands of Jewish life, and we have to replace those who had been the creators um, of um, Jewish sacred music. 
Now we could replicate this in the words of Yiddish writers, in the words of uh, um, Jewish educators. We have to pick up where they left off. They, um, when they left off, it was because somebody, somebody brutally murdered them. But now under the beneficence of American democracy and American opportunity, uh, we can build um, where um, they, we, we can uh, now rebuild. Now, one subtext to this whole conversation uh, was that in fact, American Jewish communal leaders always said that uh, American Jews were incapable of um, doing this, that they were a shallow, derivative, inauthentic um, a spot in the Jewish world. They had received European Jewish culture and uh, whatever they had, um, had come from abroad. It was certainly true of much of the intellectual leadership of American Jewry. It had been Europeans who came to America and assumed positions in Jewish, um, uh, in the seminaries, in other institutions of Jewish learning, um, at the pulpits. And now that's cut off. Now there's nobody else to come in and now we've got to do it um, ourselves. So um, if uh, very quickly, I want to look at um, some of the um, both contexts and motivations um, in which this um, doing it themselves uh, became really salient um, and again, forced them into resilience. So first they really embarked upon a memorial process. How do we create a memorial to um, uh, the millions of Jews whose lives were um, cut so short? Um, should it be through ritual? Should it be through books? Should it be through some hunks of marble in the ground uh, that is some kind of physical memorial? Uh, what, what should it be? Um, so the rabbis of the United States through the Synagogue Council of America actually came up with an idea of using the 10th of Tevet, um, at one of the minor feast day, fast days on the Jewish calendar as a, a day set aside to memorialize the Jews um, uh, uh, who had been killed by the Nazis. In fact, as early as 1943, um, the rabbis of the synagogue council said, again, we have to be resilient. We have to create something new uh, in order to memorialize what had happened. Now there's a whole history around the 10th of Tay that why it um, kind of ended up getting uh, pushed aside, partly uh, through the creation of Yom HaShoah. Uh, but um, I see that as an example of resilience or writing new prayers, okay? Um, group of American um, Jewish communal activists, writers, rabbis, and so on. Uh, through the aegis of the American Jewish Congress in 1952, wrote a short document which was um, to be to be read at uh, Passover um, Seder. Um, it was called the Seder of Remembrance, and um, on the Seder night, we remember with reverence and love the million six million of our brothers who died at the hands of the tyrant more wicked than the Pharaoh who enslaved our fathers in the land of Egypt. And then it it goes on, but the fact is, they said there's this crisis. And we've got to do something new. We can't just have the old the old Seder, the one we know, the one our parents had, the one our grandparents had. We've got to do something new because we have just endured this tragedy. So resilience in order to remember and remember in order to um, keep Jewish culture alive and meaningful. Okay, they said we also have to be resilient because there are chores now, there are tasks now that are on our shoulders and actually on nobody else's because at the end of the war, the United States is the largest, freest, most institutionally rich, most powerful, freest Jewish and wealthiest Jewish population in the world. And all money, all of financial support for the survivors are gonna come from us. Okay, so we have to uh, show a kind of um, dedication to coming up with new fundraising strategies, okay, so that we can collect money to uh, um, aid um, uh, the uh, remnants, the Sherita uh, Pleita, um, who are left behind. 
So that's one reason they understood. They had no choice but to uh, to be resilient, uh, to be flexible, because if they didn't do it, these people would languish. And indeed, until the uh, money begins to come in from um, uh, through the claims conference, nearly every penny that went to the um, uh, Jews, the displaced persons camps, came from the Jews of the United States. Okay, they believed that they had to be resilient, um, uh, not only to remember and to use that remembering to keep uh, um, to, to keep Jewish culture viable uh, in in America, um, and not only to um, use um, their resilience in order to aid the survivors, but they saw that there was a um, uh, um, that they had a particular um, role or particular um, uh, task to make sure that the United States, so you know, the country that emerges um, at the top of world power, I guess, in this struggle with the Soviet Union, but they had to um, uh, make sure that the United States uh, uh, and the American people understood the history of what had happened to uh, make sure that um, uh, Germany uh, answered for its uh, crimes. And so that um, in their recreation of Jewish communal practice and Jewish communal life, they kept uh, uh, emphasizing the way in which um, the uh, um, public should not forget that uh, not only that these Jews had uh, been uh, uh, murdered, but that somebody did it, okay, and that that somebody had to uh, answer for for their um, for for their crimes, and so um, essentially they're saying if we don't show this a new kind of determination, a strength, a flexibility that we had not had before, um, these kinds of chores, these kinds of um, they often talked about them, in fact, as um, sacred uh, chores, sacred tasks, um, then this um, horrendous history will get forgotten. Okay, So that became part of uh, what we might think of as the, the, the resilience uh, package or the resilience um, project that was on their um, chores, uh, on their shoulders. Um, they also believed they had to um, make sure that America and the world came out of this um, uh, nightmare uh, more uh, equal, more free, more democratic, more liberal, uh, less prone to demonizing people because of their uh, religion or their race um, or uh, um, their, national, their national origins. And so many of the political projects undertaken by American Jewry, involvement in civil rights, involvement in the call for immigration reform, uh, involved the call for the genocide convention, for the United States Senate to pass the genocide convention, um, calls um, uh, to have the United States be an ardent supporter of the United Nations. Um, every one of these um, items on what we could call the liberal agenda um, was articulated through the aegis or through the vehicle of remembering the Holocaust and the need to rebuild the world in a way that uh, would uh, essentially prevent such a uh, tragedy uh, happening again. And here, um, I think it's really important to look at the role that American Jewry, in this context, primarily through the American Jewish Committee, but not only played in the writing and in the um, introduction to the world of the Genocide Convention. And so Raphael Lemkin was on the payroll of the American Jewish Committee for all those decades. And when um, the, uh, um, the, treaty, the Genocide Treaty came up to the United States Senate, and by the way, the United States um, Senate did not pass it until the end of the 1980s, uh, but every time it came up, American Jewry through National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods and National Council of Jewish Women, American Jewish Committee, the Workers Serve, Workmen Circle, and so on, they all went into high gear to call for the US Senate to pass the Genocide Convention. So their political action really revved up, their polit political action amplified because they understood that the tragedy of the Holocaust uh, forced them to uh, act differently. Again, I think a very good example 
is until the late 1930s, until actually I would even date it specifically until Kristallnacht, um, American Jewish involvement with um, the civil rights movement for um, uh, uh, black people was, it was extensive, but it was always just individuals. Individual Jews ha did this, individuals, Jews participated in that, but it's not until 1938 and then not really until after World War II that American Jewish community organizations, American religious and defense organizations publicly and in their own name uh, stand up for the passage of civil rights legislation. So again, you see that how that event made them bolder and made them, uh, uh, made them aware that they couldn't keep acting the way they had. It was a brand new world. So too that resilience um, that we're talking about, the ad adaptability, adaptability to adversity, certainly um, can be seen in the way in which American Jewish organizations and institutions um, embraced um, Zionism and um, the calls for uh, some kind of Jewish homeland and um, support for Israel after um, 1948 and organizations and institutions which had previously been uh, neutral on Zionism or maybe even slightly hostile really changed. Okay, um, the uh, Nazi onslaught uh, essentially told them, you know, here's this trauma, we can't keep doing things the way we have, and there has to be this new element uh, uh, that will be added uh, into uh, what um, exists on the Jewish political agenda. So um, when we um, think of resilience as the ability to change and the ability um, to see adversity and um, uh, they would say come out stronger than they had um, their um, the willingness of groups like the reform movement to embrace Zionism was uh, B'nai B'rith is another example to embrace Zionism is very much a product of a uh, a trauma uh, which they which they um, decided was crucial for um, a newer um, and better uh, world. Okay, and then finally, um, and obviously I look forward to your questions. Um, this is a very quick recap, but going back to something I began with, um, efforts to, um, be, to, to, to strengthen Jewish life in America, be it um, greater commitment to Jewish education, uh, new, greater commitment to the religious movements, um, new kinds of institutions or practices within those Jewish movements, um, uh, Jewish literature, the expansion of the support of Jewish literature, the uh, support of, um, of the Jewish arts um, were in this period after the war justified uh, in the uh, name of the um, of, of the six million in the name of um, uh, Jewish uh, uh, um, the Jewish life that uh, no longer existed and the uh, and the role that American Jews had to play in this. Now, as I began, um, and I'm going to as I began, I'm going to uh, brought draw this to a close and say that they had no idea how to do any of these things. They had no precedent. They had no model. Um, the, the rabbis were trying to figure out what to do, how to have a new Memorial Day. When was the last time a Memorial Day that was liturgically entered into the Jewish um, repertoire? Or the, the writers and the activist, communal activists who wrote that Passover reading, when was the last time something new was entered into the, um, uh, certainly the Ashkenazi um, uh, Seder ritual? So they had no precedent. Okay, for doing this. They also had uh, no guidance, no leaders, because it was a, for better or for worse, um, that was one of the hallmarks of American Jewish life. It was leaderless, okay? Every movement, every congregation, every community, every institution, every publication could do what it wanted, okay? And uh, those of, I don't know how many of you study American Jewish history, uh, but you know that every time there was a um, argument in a synagogue about uh, either personality 
or about uh, some innovation, people didn't like it, they just broke off and founded a new synagogue. Okay, there was nobody to say you can't do that. And every time they were unhappy with one uh, newspaper magazine, fine, we'll far start a new one. So they had no precedent, they had no leadership, and they were constantly writing back and forth letters to the editor, uh, uh, articles in newspapers, arguments at meetings about what was a fitting memorial and what was the best way in which to demonstrate that trauma, in that resilience in the face of trauma. They also had no American models to follow. There's nobody else doing this at the time and certainly not in the uh, same way. And therefore they were all on their own. Um, and in this kind of, it might, you know, kind of looking at it, it seems like a chaotic jumble, um, but I'm gonna say that that's where the resilience came from. It came from the fact that they knew they had to do it. They had no idea how to do it. They had no one to tell them how to do it, but they were gonna do it anyhow. And um, some plans that uh, they tried didn't work, others did. Um, it was experimental, it was improvisational, but it all showed us an ability to um, change course, to um, uh, begin a process of um, uh, um, healing, okay? And um, to uh, uh, pursue old goals, but in drastically new ways, and but by doing it in drastically new ways, the old goals uh, changed uh, as well. So I think I have taken up my time uh, and I look forward to the conversation and then the um, questions. So thank you very much um, for uh, your, your talk. Um, I already have a couple, I, I've been writing notes down frantically. Um, <laughs> And and I, I maybe I have to go in a in a in a in a systematic order. Um, I'd like maybe in a, a good example uh, of where in this 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 uh, chaos and this they, no one knows you know there's no models and uh, Jewish institutions and communities are are sort of winging it as you might say. You mentioned at the beginning that they there was no agreement and they argued amongst themselves and they competed amongst themselves as well. Wait, what are maybe some, I mean, you mentioned examples of where they, they pulled it off, so, so to speak, of, of having consensus, but where were some areas maybe where they didn't agree and they had, I mean, that we might know of where they you know, had uh, differing opinions on things to do? Okay, okay great. I mean, that's a great one. So I don't know how much you might know about it now, but for example, every community had uh, every large community, and I'm talking about large, even, you know, like even a place like Kansas City. So we're not talking just New York or just New York and Chicago, but every most um, me large, medium sized communities every year had a Warsaw Ghetto Memorial Program. Okay. And um, in, a, in a town, there might be two or three different Warsaw Ghetto Memorial programs. And um, who's gonna get the best speaker? Who's gonna get the governor to come and speak? Who's gonna get the mayor? Who's, uh, which, which one of these is gonna get the greatest publicity? Uh, which, will, which will draw the biggest crowd? Okay, now to a certain degree, each one of those organizations wanted to show, look, at, we're bigger, we're stronger, we're more powerful. And there's wonderful correspondence where, um, it was in a New York one, where the Jewish Labor Committee, which had a, um, uh, a, a uh, Warsaw Ghetto Memorial Program saying, we tried to get Eleanor Roosevelt, but the American Jewish Congress got her already. Okay, so uh, their own reputation was tied to how they were gonna memorialize the Holocaust. The other, which I think is really interesting is that there was a, a, a kind of the beginning of a process to create a memorial in New York City, a physical memorial. It was gonna be in Riverside Park. And you can still actually go there and see where the, um, uh, um, the ground was broken and they put in a, a sort of, uh, the, just the ground, not even the ground floor, but just sort of the cornerstone was put down. And there are people who are writing and saying, this is not the way to memorialize the Holocaust, to have a big uh, uh, statue. This is like 1947, 1948. That is not the way to do it. We need that money to invest in Jewish education. 
We need that money to survive to help the survivors. Who needs a big granite marker? Mm. Okay. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> nobody's saying we don't need to do anything, but it's just what's the right way to do it? I mean, that's that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, Another thing that I, I, I have noticed, and it may, it's maybe a, one of the, the core points that I'm stressing a little bit during our, our series here on resiliency is um, the, the individual versus institutional sort of aspects of, of this resiliency. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, in, it sounds like a huge amount of this. I mean, it's also no uh, coincidence. It's, it, 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 Jews were very communitarian. I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's in the group. It's how we deal with things as a community. Um, you know, the, the, the resilience uh, originates outside of, of, of the group, outside of the synagogue, outside of Jewish institutions. But was there a discourse about, or I mean, even perhaps personal anecdotes um, from American Jews who were, de who confronted this you know the, the the crisis who confronted the 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 aftermath of the holocaust and and personally you know had some sort of resilience in it or is it mostly in this sort of realm mm -hmm. of of how institutions uh and the community at large dealt with it okay i mean again i think that's a really great question and obviously it's very hard for the historian to really get at you know kind of ordinary individuals uh, um, kind of discussing this, you know, they don't necessarily, they're, they, they're not kind enough to us historians to leave uh, records of what they talked about. But there is a lot of, for example, literature that's written um, and um, in English, in Yiddish, um, that uh, spontan that, that be spoke, be, uh, uh, demonstrates a degree of spontaneity, um, artists, Okay, uh, Corey dancers, musicians um, who uh, record this music, or who there's a there was a wonderful there was an example that the 92nd Street Y in New York was a kind of showcase for modern dance, and so a um, in 1947 a uh, dancer named uh, Sophie Maslow. Uh, there's no reason you would have heard of her unless you're a, a fan of modern dance. But she choreographs a dance called um, uh, Kaddish. And in the program notes for the, um, uh, um, uh, for the dance, it said, this dance is dedicated to the memory of the six million. Okay, so this is an artist on her own saying, okay, I, I, that's my job. I'm a choreographer, I'm a dancer, but this is, I'm going to bring this into my work. I'm going to bring this into my artistry. Um, uh, so uh, there's lots of that that went on. It's not in any one place, but it's sort of sprinkled across the uh, communal landscape. Um, one place I found really interesting materials, which is kind of both individual and communal, is that in Jewish summer camps in this period, they did a lot with Holocaust. They didn't call it Holocaust education, but you can see in their notes of what they did over the summer, 1954, 1955, 1956, they did a lot of programming around the Holocaust. And, um, and so in the uh, notes from the counselors, you know, how did the summer go? They said, well, the kids wanted us to do more with Anne Frank. Okay, so the kids are sitting around and saying, when the counselor says, okay, tell me how you felt about what we did this summer. They said, we really wanted more on Anne Frank. So there, you know, we see again, these these teenagers or actually even preteens participating in a Jewish communal um, event where they're saying, this is something that really moves us. Okay, and um, we want more of it. So um, I think you're right that it takes place within communal settings, or at least we can know about what goes on in the communal settings, but yet the, the um, clearly the communal settings by definition have to be responsive to the uh, individual members because the people aren't going to be there unless it speaks to their um, uh, sentiments and to their um, to their feelings. Mm. Um, and then moving not, uh, another step beyond that, uh, at the end, you, you mentioned 
uh, very clearly that they, they're not operating with models. Not only are they not operating with Jewish models, but they weren't mm -hmm. operating with American models for this. And that caused uh, uh, sort of piggybacking on the last question, boom, right in my head. Um, uh, in, in, in particularly in the context, we're talking about crises in general uh, for the world. Did the way that the Jewish community in the United States uh, deal with this serve as a model for any sort of resiliency? I mean, I think you know maybe where I'm going with this a little bit immediately then with the civil rights movement with, I mean, can you see any linkage between the, the 40s and 50s and then what follows uh, in, in time? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, you know, again, very interesting. And so I'm gonna, say this on two levels. So for one thing, it's very interesting in actually somewhat later than that, when, for example, Armenian Americans begin to um, say it's time, you know, a long time has passed since our genocide and we now need to uh, bring it onto uh, the larger landscape. They turn to the model of Jew, Jews organizing around the Holocaust and memorializing the Holocaust. And so too with Cambodians when they come to the United States, and they want um, their story um, uh, told. Um, I think in the African-American context, it's very important. Obviously, uh, Black Americans had been uh, for um, a century or more already. Uh, Hold, we, we, have, we just got the message from our tech people. Can you maybe turn your microphone on and then back, uh, off and then back on again quickly? We're getting some me? reverb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh my gosh. Uh, so mute myself and then unmute. Mm -hmm. You're still muted. How's that? No, it's still a little, it sounds a little, uh, is there something on the microphone maybe? Um, I don't see anything. I don't know what to do. Uh, Hold on, hmm. just checking to make sure is it, maybe it got better. Okay, um, so actually what we'll do, uh, we will then end the live stream for, for now, just so that the, the live stream part of it, so we'll stay in here and then we'll finish that, but uh, j just for the, the purposes of having the, the sound issue anyway. Um, so I guess I'll say on this, for those who are watching by the live stream, um, it was a very wonderful discussion. Uh, we will now be moving over to all of us here amongst the rabbinical and cantorial students. We'll get the end of, of your answer in a second. And thanks so very much for everyone watching at home on YouTube and um, have a, a great night. I think we'll be going out.